I'm a travel documentary photographer. And I believe that my real classroom, the place where I actually became a photographer, was India, a country that I visited many times over the years. In this video, I'm gonna share five of the most important lessons that no one seems to be sharing in relation to travel and documentary photography. And of course, I learned these lessons in India. A couple of days ago, I uploaded another video with five other lessons. And if you want, you can watch that later because all of these lessons are valuable and there isn't any particular order to them. Oh, and of course, importantly, all of the lessons are very applicable outside of India. So wherever you are in the world, they will help your photography. So let's get right into them. Having a cultural bridge is crucial whenever you find yourself in a country where the culture is radically different to the place where you're from. For someone like me, born in the former USSR and raised in Australia, India often felt like a different planet. This is why it was so important to find people who are at least somewhat familiar with my culture, with my language, people who could act as what I call cultural bridges. My main cultural bridge in India was my wonderful friend, translator and guide, Hardik. We made many journeys together. He always made sure to help me avoid cultural misunderstandings, which in turn led us to have deeper access to some of the communities that I wanted to photograph. An example, I remember we were in Rajasthan on the outskirts of the desert in this predominantly Bishnoi village. Bishnois are a community known for their strict vegetarianism as well as their conservation of nature. And in this village, one man uh, one day decided to ask me, hey, in your country, do you eat meat? Just purely out of curiosity. And you know, I was ready to answer honestly that yeah, I do eat meat. Uh, what's the big deal? But Hardik very quickly stopped me. No, no, no. I'd been shooting in this village over the last few days documenting that Abadi community who lived side by side with the Bishnois. And people felt so good about having us around. Hardik explained that if I were to tell the truth, then very likely everyone would be very uncomfortable with this truth. In fact, they might even feel regret for having welcomed me in their village. And he was right. I was a little stubborn, but we decided that instead of me saying that I eat meat, we'd say that people in my country eat meat and you should have seen the change, the shift of atmosphere as I said this. It was almost as if I had said that people in my country eat children. Wow, I thought it was a good thing that they didn't ask me this right at the beginning of my stay. I realized then that sometimes it's better to tell a white lie to adapt to local sensitivities in place of holding on to some categorical truth. I mean, if you think about it, in a situation like that, what purpose does holding onto your truth have? For me, it's all about respecting your environment and your circumstances. These kinds of nuances are rarely mentioned by travel and documentary photographers. But to me, these are the real secret tips and tricks, much more so than the gimmicky content that's set up to be clickbait on YouTube. If you want to learn more nuanced and real life tips, about travel photography, then you might want to check out The Photographer's Mindset India, my newest educational resource, which I'm currently launching. This is the reason for all of these India videos and there's also a special price while the launch is happening. So just wanted to let you know. And so when I wasn't with Hardik, then I relied on other local friends and guides to act as my cultural bridges. They were so valuable not only for avoiding unpleasant situations, but also for gaining access to opportunities that I would not have been able to access without them. Having these cultural bridges in India helped me understand just how important they could be. As long as you're in a country where the culture is radically different to the place where you're from, you can always use that cultural bridge. You'll definitely be better off having this kind of person by your side. And here's just a little bit of food for thought. Uh, perhaps if you are uh, thinking uh, of getting a new lens or a new piece of gear for your next trip, maybe you should reconsider that and save the money to maybe hire somebody to be a cultural bridge for you.
While we're on the subject of culture, this lesson kind of goes into the same category. In India, I learned that not everything revolves around money. For many of us from the more consumerist societies where we associate time and effort with money, this can be quite a shift in perspective. In India, many people might appear poor in the Western sense, but they're not looking for money. They might just want to connect, to spend time with you. Now, how is this relevant to your photography? Well, if you make a photo of someone, please don't hand out money like you just made a transaction. In fact, sometimes offering money can be offensive. Many cultures don't have this mindset that everything is a transaction and imposing this view over time can and it will change the cultural dynamic. In India, hospitality is deeply valued. From the Hindus, I would often hear, mother is God, father is God, guest is God. So as a guest in the country, your interactions aren't always seen as transactional. Of course, when I say this, I am talking about genuine, regular people. Big difference between them and some of the people in the very touristy areas who just want to make a quick buck. Sometimes the best way is to simply send the photo that you made to the people via WhatsApp or whatever other means. The main lesson that I'm getting at here, and I really, really hate kind of being preachy, but I've seen so many places change radically over the years, really have the cultural dynamic change completely. So the main lesson is that if you want to give something, then try to do it with minimal impact on the cultural dynamic of the place. And this applies to absolutely any place in the world. If you want to give back, well, try to give back with your time. Or, well, here we dressed up in traditional clothes because the locals really wanted to see this. They thought it would be nice. I felt very silly, but they had given us their warmth and their hospitality. So we thought, why not? You can also give a culturally significant gift, and this can be very small, but from my experience, it's far more meaningful than just handing out money. I remember on the island nation of Vanuatu, you would share a drink of kava with male friends. I feel like I really established a connection with the guys because I did that. In Peru, the common thing is to share coca leaves, particularly valued in some of the more remote places where they can't just buy coca whenever they want. And I also remember in Mauritania, we shared a goat with a family of nomads. I cooked a meal and we invited everybody. Again, a wonderful bonding experience and a more culturally appropriate way to say thank you. The cynics out there might just say, shut the hell up, money talks. But I believe that there is no place for cynicism in travel photography. If you feel like you are full of cynicism, then maybe it's time to step away. In India, I learned the true value of on-the-ground research, which means actually traveling around, looking around, and then talking to people about potential photo subjects. Now, these days we do tend to rely very heavily on online resources. Occasionally we contact another photographer or another traveler to get some info, maybe to get the contact of a guide, and that's all well and good, but Ultimately, you are just talking about the stuff that's already been done, quite likely, many times before you. Here's the thing, a lot of information is online, but you'd be surprised by how much isn't. Or if it is, it's sometimes buried so deep that you wouldn't even find it unless you know the specific words to search for. And so this is where on the ground, in the field research comes in. I learned the lesson years ago in India, and it's just as relevant today. Also, if we're talking about places, nature, landscapes, then it's almost mind-blowing how many amazing places are not mentioned anywhere online. That's until they become overrun with tourism. Whether in India, Brazil, Peru, or Argentina, where I am now, nothing beats the insights that you gain from on-the-ground research. From driving around, talking to people, from walking around the next corner, going down a lesser traveled road. If you want to create unique photos, not just the same photos that everybody else has, then you have to do the legwork. When I was working on my project about the Rabadi Shepherds, this is what me and Hardik used to do. We'd literally ride around on a motorcycle and look for Rabadi with herds of animals along roads to see if there's potential for photos there. Then during downtime, we'd grab tea at a local stall 
and would start asking questions. Where can we find Rabadi people who still live a traditional life, who still dress in their distinct clothing? Where are the traditional villages? And the amount of information we gathered this way was just incredible. When I wasn't with Hardik in India, I would go to local tourism offices with a list of questions. I remember in Kerala, in different offices, I would come in and I'd say, I'm Mitchell, I'm a travel documentary photographer, and I specialize in culture and traditions. Are there any interesting cultural events or festivals happening in the area right now? This approach led me to elephant festivals, Tayam performances, traditional Hindu schools, tiny riverside fish markets, boat making villages, and so much more. I later connected with governors, professors, and independent researchers. And sure, you can do it online, but it's different when you do it in person. I felt like people were more excited to help when they would see me face to face. And in part, I think it's because they understood that whatever information they're sharing with me, I would actually be using it. I'd be doing something with it. So if you want to create photos that stand out, the lesson I took from India and have applied in all of my travels is to invest in on the ground research. It might take more time, but that's how you create work that's truly unique. This lesson kind of follows on from the previous one because once you find out about those places that very few go to and very few know, how do you get to them? This is where the importance of personal transport for your independence comes in. I learned to ride a scooter in Thailand and in India, I think I took things up a few levels. I got a motorbike and I realized just how liberating it was to have it. Countless opportunities opened up to me as a photographer. I could go to remote villages. I could be in a certain place at the time that I wanted to be there. Without my own transport, it would be hard to get to all those places that I was pointed to by the tourism office, by the people who helped me. At times, these venues were pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And often I needed to quickly get from one place to another. So having a motorbike allowed me all this and it was an absolute game changer. This was an incredible, incredible tool. It allowed me to be much more productive and it gave me a huge advantage over so many people that did not have this tool. Now, I will say that in India and in other countries, there is public transport. You can always hire taxis, tuk-tuks, rickshaws, you know, all of that sort of stuff. But sometimes just organizing things with a reliable person in a new place is challenging, very challenging. I've taken this idea of personal transport much further. Those of you who follow my channel know that these days we're traveling and living most of the time in a camper. Freedom to be where we want, when we want, on a completely different level. You don't need to do what I've done by any means. What I want you to really understand is just how much having my own ride over the years has contributed to my photography everywhere in the world. This is the final lesson that I want to talk about. Finding and appreciating the magic in the everyday life has sort of become a mantra of mine, regardless of where I travel. In India, everyday life is incredibly vibrant and saturated with activity, more so than anywhere else that I've been. The sheer energy and the unpredictability of daily life there make it a photographer's dream. India taught me to see the beauty and the potential in the ordinary. And it taught me to always be switched on, photographically speaking, ready to capture those fleeting moments when something ordinary becomes extraordinary or incredibly photogenic. It feels like there's always something happening around the corner something that could make for a powerful photograph. India made me appreciate life as the greatest show on earth. Since then, I've focused on photographing life itself with all its subtleties everywhere that I've traveled. And sure, not every place is as vibrant as India, but once you've experienced that intensity, you begin to appreciate the quieter and more nuanced moments too. And it's not that the more intense is better or worse, it's just about understanding and appreciating the diversity of life's different experiences. Alrighty, that's it. Those were the next 
five important lessons about travel and documentary photography that I wanted to share with you. And I've got to say that I'm glad I was able to take advantage of this quiet place and this nice house which we're renting while my parents are visiting. I also filmed another video with other five very important tips relating to travel and documentary photography and you can see that right here. And next week is the last week of the launch and the special price on the Photographer's Mindset India. That's about it. Check the link in the description. I will have another video for you and it will be a little different. So stay tuned.